Um, so this is this will be a really hybrid session in the sense that uh, we have got uh, two people here and uh, four people online. And uh, thank you very much. First of all, let me introduce myself. I am Giuliano Gaia. I am uh, quite at ease here because I teach in uh, this university, Digital Communication for the Arts. But I'm also the co-founder of Invisible Studio. Invisible Studio is a studio based in London. And uh, what we do is that uh, we foster innovation in, uh, in museums. And of course, uh, for us, uh, exploring everything that uh, um, can make you understand better what goes, what goes on uh, in museums and how to improve the museum experience is crucial. That's why I am uh, very grateful to Annalisa to have involved me into this uh, conference. And uh, when she asked me how to uh, organize a uh, how, how to organize a session, the, this session that I'm going to chair, well, the idea has been okay. Uh, you will be uh, showcasing very interesting cases, as we, as we have heard before. Uh, you will be showcasing very interesting cases of application of neuroscience in museums, studies of neuroscience in museums, but. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, a more basic question, because the problem with neuroscience is that it can give you uh, an enormous quantity of answers. Yes, but which is the question? How can we really make uh, our questions significant in order to have neuroscience to ask them, to, to answer them? So what, what I did is that um, I have put together a, um, a panel of people very, very expert uh, about museum experience and especially about visitor experience. And now I'll be, uh, um, I'll be introducing briefly them before starting this round table. And the idea is to making uh, uh, this round table a real round table. So, uh, with the participation and discussion, and discussion, uh, first of all, between us and also, uh, if you want, uh, we, uh, with you. And uh, the, um, so the idea was I will put together the uh, museum experience, uh, the visitor experience experts, and then ask Annalisa, and please, you provide the neuroscientist. And so the idea is that we, uh, because I, I put myself not in the neuroscience side, but uh, in the museum and visitor experience side. So we ask the question, and then uh, the neuroscientist, in this case, which is Andrea Gajoli, which I uh, absolutely thank to be here. Of course, he's not going to answer our question, but he's going to sort of tell us if, in his opinion, neuroscience is in the right position to answer this question. So that's, that's the basic idea. It's a total experiment. We'll see how it goes. But uh, the idea is exactly that one. We ask and uh, we'll see if neuroscience can answer. Because I cannot stress it enough. Uh, the problem I've seen in many, many uh, experiments and projects in museums is that, for example, the university, neuroscientists, go there, uh, make their experiments, uh, have their findings, and then these findings are not used. Are just left in some shelf and not really used during the everyday life. So let's uh, try to make it the other way. Let's start with the questions from museums and from people very expert in museums. And so let me uh, just briefly introduce to you uh, the people here. I will start uh, with uh, online. And uh, first of all, we have got, um, I start with Licia Calvi. Licia is, uh, is a friend of mine. I had, uh, um, well, I would say all of you are friends of mine, <laughs> which is <laughs> which is a very nice uh, emotion for me of being, uh, of being here. Um, Licia uh, works at the University of Breda and, uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, when I've been uh, at, at her university, what I really appreciated is the fact that uh, together with uh, uh, her colleagues, they try to apply in real museums and in small museums, which is something uh, that I find very valuable, 
what they do is that they um, try to apply what they study at the university in the real environment of the museums. For example, uh, conducting some digital experiments, very interesting, uh, in a house museums uh, in a house museum, and uh, um, also trying some neuroscience experiments. But what I really uh, like to stress is that. Uh, it's always based on the visitor experience, as Licia will, uh, will tell us later. Then we have got, uh, and we really uh, thank her because uh, I think uh, uh, the timetable is incredibly different. <laughs> but uh, Dana is a former colleague of mine um, at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And, and then she, after the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, she went on becoming one of the most renowned experts in design thinking for museums. And uh, uh, which means that uh, um, she really focuses on uh, the uh, on empathy with the visitors, and uh, she is uh, conducting uh, lot, lots of projects in different museums, as uh, she is uh, probably um, tell us, and uh, um, that's why. Uh, being so uh, expert and so focused on how the visitors feel, I expect uh, from her uh, to understand which, uh, again, which uh, questions could, uh, could come out that could be interesting to pose to a neuroscientist. And then we've got uh, Sandro De Bono. Uh, Sandro De Bono is, uh, again, a well-known expert in the museum field. Um, he likes to describe himself as a museum thinker, and uh, I, I'm sure he is, <laughs> in the fact that he really, uh, after having a very important experience in setting up a a uh, new kind of participatory, participatory museum uh, in the National Museum of Fine Arts in, um, in Malta, uh, the MUSA, uh, which has been an experiment we have all been uh, uh, looking very, uh, very eagerly because uh, it was very, very interesting. Uh, then Sandro came on in uh, uh, broadening uh, his activity towards uh, Europe's, uh, towards museums in Europe and, uh, and beyond Europe, and again focusing a lot in uh, the museum experience. And then um, here in um, uh, uh, here at the university, we have got again uh, with uh, so uh, Dana has got uh, like a jet lag from <laughs> uh, from different timetable, but we uh, we uh, here we have a car lag because uh, <laughs> by driving I, I think 12 hours uh, straight from Serbia from Novi Sad we have got uh, Tiana uh, no no I'll try I'll try pa Paul Koklevic no no well, no no. Nearly, nearly, okay. Um, Tiana is uh, the director of the Matisse Gallery in uh, Novi Sad, which, uh, when I visited it, uh, really, really struck me. Because this is an example of a visitor center museum. And by the way, um, I can see uh, Sandro De Bono smiling because he was involved also in, in the project of this, uh, of this gallery. So um, again, it's a kind of very nice network here. And um, last but not least, for the museum side, and then we will come to the neuroscience side. <laughs> uh, last but not least, for the uh, museum side, we've got here Lucia Cataldo. Lucia Cataldo, um, she's very well known in Italy because she's uh, written um, a very famous uh, handbook about uh, uh, really the, the museum, but also focusing a lot about the museum experience. So not only from the museum side, but also on how museums can really interact with visitors. So again, another important perspective on the, um, on the museum experience. So we, you, as you can understand, we really have a, a very um, powerful, uh, I would say, uh, group of experts. And with the, uh, it's like it's like a match, but <laughs> on uh, on the other side, um, when I asked uh, um, Annalisa to provide me with the neurosciences, uh, she told me, "Ah, oh, okay, okay, don't worry, don't worry, I've got the guy." <laughs> and so we got it. Andrea, Andrea works in the Catholic University in Milan. He, 
I know uh, it was impossible for you for you to come uh, to come here, but uh, we are very grateful that uh, that you are here, and uh, you work uh, on between neuroscience and psychology. If I'm not uh, if I'm not wrong, yeah? no. So uh, please. Uh, yes, actually, um, I, I would not define myself uh, a neuroscientist uh, in, in the sense that uh, I'm an experimental psychologist. Uh, but today, experimental psychology is uh, included uh, in the wide umbrella of neuroscience um, disciplines. Uh, so, in some sense, uh, I could also consider myself uh, interested in the neuroscience fields. But uh, in my intervention, I, I will try to uh, clarify that uh, neuroscience is not the only discipline uh, that can contribute uh, uh, to this challenge, actually. Very well, very well. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got some sort of buzz. Do you do you think uh, is there a way to? Uh, no. Okay. Well, we, we hope it won't uh, it won't come back again. Okay. Perfect. And um, so now that uh, uh, we've got to start our roundtable, um, we have got an uh, I would say uh, an interesting introduction because uh, and thank you, Annalise, as well because Annalisa brought, uh, invited uh, here John Falk. So John Falk, for whoever works in museums, is like, uh, wow. <laughs> so there is God and then John Falk and then... <laughs> because his, muse his book, uh, The Museum Experience, is, uh, is a seminal book, is the book about uh, uh, visitor experience. So, John unfortunately couldn't make, uh, couldn't make it uh, uh, even online because he had a concurring, uh, um, a concurring commitment. But what he did is that uh, he uh, recorded a video and uh, I've seen it, it's uh, very interesting. So I think we can use this video as a starting point for our discussion. So um, I ask you if you please can send the video. Well, hello from Oregon in the United States. So I'm going to deliver a short statement and uh, I appreciate having the opportunity to do this. So as public institutions go these days, museums are relatively old, having been around in some form or another for hundreds of years. However, the appearance and focus of today's museums bear only a passing resemblance to its ancestors. The collection, preservation, and study of precious objects and ideas clearly remains a central focus of most museums, but increasingly these activities are becoming merely means to a greater end, and that is the goal of supporting the public's learning and enjoyment. Reflective of this growing commitment to the public, museum professionals have become increasingly focused on learning how best to improve the quality of their offerings, how best to enhance these experiences that millions of people annually engage in. In response to this growing interest in improving the museum experience has been the development of an expanding number of resources on the subject. Every year, dozens of new books and hundreds of journal articles are written about the museum experience. And every year, scores of researchers and practitioners deliver conference presentations on the latest and greatest approaches for improving the public's museum experience. I confess to being one of those adding to this growing pile of resources. In fact, I confess I'm probably one of the greatest contributors to this pile of books and articles and talks, having been at this task for nearly half a century. And year after year, I've strived to better understand why people visit museums, what they do there, and what they take away from those experiences. And it's in pursuit of these objectives that I have conducted many hundreds of studies, written more than a dozen books, several hundred articles, and given hundreds of talks like this on the museum experience, all in an effort to turn my understandings into better museum practice. Thus, it is from this perspective, the perspective of someone who has long toiled in the trenches of thinking long and hard about how best to analyze the public's museum experiences and convert those analyses into useful ideas for museum practices that I make these short remarks. So I'm delighted to be part of this meeting organized by Dr. Bonsi a meeting I believe will make an important contribution to the understandings of museum experiences. This, of course, is certainly not the first 
meeting like this seeking to apply insights from the field of psychology to the topic of museum experiences. But this meeting's focus on the latest insights and tools from the brain sciences are quite unique. It's fair to say, largely due to the work of the brain sciences, we have discovered more in just the past couple of decades about how the mind works than was known in all the previous decades combined. The insights and understandings of human thinking and behaving that we've been developing by these investigations continues to grow at a rapid pace. Thus, the presentations and discussions that occur here can only begin to support and build a foundation, an initial sense of how to create a brain-friendly museum. Like all complex edifices, and the museum experience certainly represents a complex edifice, a sound and strong foundation is essential. These foundational understandings about the museum experiences will provide museum professionals with a secure launch pad they need in order to rethink their practices and to create new approaches and innovations for today's and tomorrow's visitors. I've been specifically asked in these comments to address the question, how could neuroscience help museums? We know neuroscience can offer many answers, but in the end, which are the questions that would be worth trying to answer? So I would say in answer to that question that I would single out two things, the role of emotions and how experiences at places like museums result in enhanced well-being. If I had to summarize what I've learned about the museum experience over my decades long research career, I would say that the museum visitor experience always begins with emotions and always ends with well-being. For years, cognitive scientists essentially ignored emotions, assuming they were only marginally relevant for understanding how people think, learn, and make decisions. Thanks in large part to advances in the neurosciences, it is now apparent that virtually everything going on in the brain, including awareness and perception, learning and decision-making, all involve the emotions. As a consequence, it's now widely accepted that far from being marginally important, Emotions are actually a consistent and central feature of all human cognition. To understand why people use museums, what they do there, and what they learn requires understanding something about the role emotions play in all these different stages of the museum experience. Unfortunately, as a consequence of their long neglect as a topic of study, and despite the current appreciation of their importance, emotions remain poorly understood and largely understudied including within and particularly within the museum context. This is likely to be an area of ever increasing investigation in the coming decades, and we can look forward to significant improvements in museum practice as greater understanding and develops for how to most effectively harness the power of user emotions. Now, the second area, and in a similar way, a new frontier is represented by understanding museum experiences in terms of well-being. As I discuss at length in several of my latest writings, I now believe that the fundamental reason people use museums, as well as the fundamental benefits they derive from these experiences, all relate to well-being. Like emotions, it is only recently that brain scientists have come to appreciate just how fundamental a process the pursuit of well-being is for humans. As I've argued, well-being is so fundamental that it cannot be understood exclusively through a psychological lens. Well-being is a basic biological process of mechanism for achieving balance with one's world. In fact, the need to achieve well-being related balance is as at the core of what it means to be alive. And all living things pursue well-being, as do all humans, and as a consequence, the pursuit of well-being underlies everything people do. As researchers and museum professionals come to more fully understand the intensive, the fundamental importance of well-being, it too is likely to become an area of ever more intensive focus. As my research has shown, humans are strongly drawn to museum experiences because they believe these experiences support and enhance some act, aspect of their personal, intellectual, social, or physical well-being. Thus, the question for museum professionals will increasingly become not if it is possible to create museum 
experiences that support well-being, but rather in what form, in what ways, and to what degree can we create museum experiences that maximally achieve this outcome. So in closing, I'd just like to say I wish I could be there and join you in person at this meeting, but I'm delighted to be able to at least share my ideas via video. I hope you have a wonderful and productive meeting and thank you for your time. Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you for the video. Uh, thank you, John Falk, even if you're not uh, hearing us. And uh, so emotions and well-being, that's uh, his first uh, answers. Uh, his first answer, the two question that uh, uh, could be posed to neuroscience that would be very important for museums to, to ask. And so, well, I'm passing the ball to, to you. Um, I could start with Licia, if you, if you like, uh, since you have been that I'm introduced. And uh, what do you think about this, uh, about this question? So, uh, which are the, the important questions that would you like to, to ask if you could open the brain or your visitors without hurting them, of course? And, uh, and also, what do you think about uh, the, these two uh, key points uh, that uh, John Falk made, so emotions and well-being. Up, up to you. Thank you, Giuliano. First of all, thank you very much for having me at this panel. It's really a pleasure to be here and to meet uh, all of you. Um, as you were saying, as Giuliano was saying at the beginning, we are a University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands, so indeed we try to, you know, test in the field all the theories and the models that we develop. So uh, this is why we work very much with museums and other cultural institutions. But to come back to the question, for me, uh, a relevant question that I would like to have uh, answered by neuroscience, maybe also, and that relates very much to what, what uh, John Falk was uh, mentioning, is uh, the make the uh, how visitors make sense of their visits in the museums. So he was mentioning what they take away from their visit, indeed how they make sense of what they see, how they select, uh, you know, the objects or the items they want to get in contact with to look at. And, and related to that also how they navigate the museum space. Sometimes, you know, uh, we give them or they have a map, a floor map of the exhibition, but uh, in the experiments that we have done, we see that they hardly look at them, they just wander around. And then at the end, when you ask them, what have you understood? Uh, you get very different answers. In the case in the, that you were mentioning, Juliana, at the beginning, we have indeed uh, redesigned uh, four rooms, four period rooms of a city museum in, in a town in the south of the Netherlands using storytelling. And this is also a tool that we use very much to design experiences. And obviously storytelling is very closely related with emotions, with triggering emotions, with raising emotions, because we really believe that in this way, people can empathize with the story, with the protagonist of the story that we tell, and they can uh, more uh, more easily connect with the content that we present, with the story that we tell them, and in this way can also make sense of uh, of the story and of the exhibition that they are exploring. However, in this uh, in this uh, case, when we have tried to assess indeed their um, meaning making, we have seen that uh, uh, that was not so straightforward. Uh, so that uh, different visitors have made, have created different meanings of the story that we have told them and that we, they have not been able to understand certain important cues. The story was told using a, a very clear storytelling model, uh, you know, more or less the, the Aristotle model with a beginning, a middle of an, of an end and uh, a climax and a resolution at the end. There were different cues distributed in the rooms. Some were just the traditional museum objects. There were also a lot of uh, interactive and digital elements that they had to discover, but it was really not a treasure hunt kind of experience. And still, you know, and at the beginning they were getting a kind of a map with all the uh, with, with a floor map, floor plan, plan, uh, plan, and also with an indication of the elements that they could interact with. But we have seen that they were hardly looking at the map, that they were, you know, running back and forth uh, to see what they could discover. And so the meaning making was really the big, uh, the big question for us. So uh, to come back to also what John was saying, certainly emotions. We have also tried to measure emotions in this particular visit using, yeah, neuroscience skin conductance. But I think that, you know, maybe the case was too small. The results 
yeah, were not yet significant. They were mainly uh, the, the, this more uh, uh, biometric study, uh, neurological study was meant to check whether you know uh, the emotions were following the story development. So really this idea of the climax and then the resolution. And in that sense, well, the answer was positive, but I think we get we need to get further than that. And for the last point about the well-being, we also believe that, you know, uh, especially when we talk about museum experiences and design museum experiences, we should pass obviously memorability into meaningfulness, but certainly also further than that into transformational experiences. And I know that Andrea is doing uh, a lot of work around liminal experiences, maybe even in that direction. So I think that can be related to well-being, the, the transformational to a certain extent, but I don't know. Uh, yet how to really design for that. So I think I don't know if my five minutes are finished, but that would be yeah, my yeah, perfect. Suggestion. Perfect. And then, of course, uh, we, we want to, to do the to make this uh, as a discussion as possible. So don't uh, don't worry about uh, about the timing. And uh, um, so, Andrea, keep notes because uh, some questions are arising here and we'll ask you if... So in this case, for example, I totally agree with you that navigational paths are incredibly interesting and mysterious sometimes. You don't know how people navigate. We can try to force them to go into certain paths in museums, but then it come, comes out that they change completely and go somewhere else. Uh, first of all, and yes, I, I would say that uh, you put uh, mm, you put up also the great uh, area of storytelling and gamification. Gamification, especially, it's very interesting. Uh, we have done quite a few projects in that sense, and we always ask ourselves, uh, but is this the good way? I mean, is it really okay? It's fun, but it, is it really engaging? Is it really good? And again, storytelling, understanding how much of the story they really got. Okay, we are telling a story, but are they getting it really? <laughs> so these are all big, uh, big question marks. I have, uh, I have to say. And um, Dana, what do you, what's your point about it? Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm so good afternoon, everybody, or good morning here in California. It's <laughs> early in the morning. Um, nice to see all of you. I will preface by saying I am I am coming from the practitioner side of you, not the academic side. I worked in museums for about 15 years, and for the past 10 years, I've worked with museums across the United States in training museum practitioners, museum professionals in human-centered design and design thinking methodologies. So I work with the, the folks inside museums on how do they make experiences better, and I provide them with a framework called design thinking or human-centered design and associated methods and tools. So one of the things I like to do when, when faced with a question like this is to use something called a problem framing method where we start to really frame what is the question we really want to ask or what are the questions we want to ask. Because so often when I work with museum professionals, I see them just jump right to the solution and say, oh, well, we know what it is. We need to do something using storytelling. We need to do something using XYZ technology. And I always like to step back and let's really focus what is the actual question or problem that we want to solve. And let's identify and prioritize which problems or questions we want to answer. And then we will methodically go through answering that question and coming up with solutions using human-centered design. So I want to share my screen and show you a tool like right when, when, when Giuliano asked me this question, the first thing I thought of was something called a um, abstraction ladder. And I want to see if this is going to work for me to share my screen. So let's try this and let's hope that this works. Okay, I really hope it works. We see it, perfect. Oh, excellent, okay. <laughs> so this is a, a tool that I use very often in my work called an abstraction ladder. It comes from the field of design thinking. I use this, this specific version is from the Luma Institute where I'm also an instructor. This is a problem framing tool. 
and it's it's pretty simple. When we go up the ladder, we ask why. Why should we solve this problem? And we can ask things like so that in order to or because. And if we go down the ladder, we ask things like how, how, in what ways might we solve this problem? And we go narrower and we say things like by considering or enabled by. So I took your question that you posed to me, which was, if you, if you could read museum visitors' minds, what would you like to know in order to create better visitor experiences? And I asked the question, well, why? Why do we want to create better visitor experiences? Mm -hmm. And then I went up the ladder. I did this many, I did many of these. I was doing this yesterday. Well, I said, because we believe that positive visitor experiences can impact visitors' well-being. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, why? Why do we believe that positive visitor experiences can impact visitors' well-being? And I said, ah, oh, because we believe in the power of museum experiences positively impact, positively impact the lives of visitors. Well, why? Why do we believe in the power of museum experiences? Like all this stuff we may take for granted. I, I want to just go, why, 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 and really dig into that. Ah, because a, a growing body of research, like we just heard from John Falk, has demonstrated that well-being begins with positive experiences. So then I said, well, maybe one of the questions we might want to be asking is, well, how might we design positive experiences to impact visitors' lives? What are other positive experiences in their lives? How can we understand the role of emotions in impacting, uh, sorry, I meant to say their experiences? So you can see, you can go up this ladder and you can really start to ask ask what, what do we want to ask? And I want to show you, I also went down the ladder and I said, okay, so if you could read visitors, museum visitors' minds, what would you like to know in order to create better visitor experiences? Well, if we go down the ladder, we might say, well, how might we better understand what's going through their minds? Because we're talking about reading their minds. Ah, we might do that by talking to them and observing them. Well, how might we talk to and observe visitors? Ah, we might offer training to all staff in human-centered design research methods. This is the work I do. It's really, how do you help staff do this? If you work in a museum, you need to be able to do this you know, quickly, easily, with the resources, limited resources you have in your museum. And then the question might be, well, how might we offer training to all staff in human-centered design research methods? Because if the staff can't answer these kind of questions because you're a very small museum with limited budget, you don't have the resources, how are you going to even answer these questions? So this is another example of I might work with a museum and say, this is what we're going to focus on. Or I might work with a museum and say, ah, no, we're going to focus on this. I'm just going to give you one more example. As you can see that I use this tool to go up and down the ladder and then figure out, OK, where do we want to focus? So if we go back up the ladder, I'll just give you one more example so I don't take up more time. So why do we want to create better visitor experiences? Ah, maybe it's because we want to attract more visitors. Why do we want to attract more visitors? Because not enough people are visiting our museum these days. Then the question might be, how might we draw and attract more visitors? What decisions, emotions, and situations prevent them from visiting? So as you can see, I'm not attempting to answer any of these questions. I just mm -hmm. want to frame the question and show you that there are many ways to frame it. And I, I did some more here, but I want to don't want to take up any more time that you can go up and down the ladder and then you can decide as a team inside your organization, your institution, museum, where do we want to focus? And from there, then you can make a, a research plan and start to answer these questions and then start to brainstorm potential solutions to these questions. So I will stop sharing. And if we have time, I can show you more of my going up and down the ladder. But just wanted to show you a tool that I would bring to answering this question, which is an abstraction ladder. Wow, Dana, that's, uh, that's uh, fantastic. I mean, you, you've done a great job. And, uh, um, and you, know, you know what, when, when you were showing it to us, I was thinking, uh, wow, you could use neurosciences in each of these branches. And even, yeah. even neuroscience, not only on your visitors, but also on the museum staff. Because, in yeah. fact, <laughs> in fact it, 
sometimes, and we know for experience since we, we work, as, as you know, we work with design thinking as well, uh, sometimes it's more uh, important what you do uh, to make the museum staff understand their own behaviors, their own desires, rather than uh, even what you, what you do with the visitors. And uh, yes, so for sure you could use a neuroscience in order to understand, yes, why, uh, for example, the, the positive experiences, which are the real positive experiences apart from the experiences that uh, people declare are positive. But maybe they're got, there are other positive experiences that maybe that they're not even aware of. And again, this will be questions to, to Andrea. Or, um, uh, yes, it's, uh, so uh, thank you for, uh, for showing this tool because I think, and maybe we'll, we'll go back to, to it even later during the discussion because we are, we are also interested in seeing uh, which other branches you, you can go on. But I think you've been very effective in showing us how uh, when you start exploring, you never, uh, you never end exploring in a way mm -hmm. and it's important to select where, where to go. Yeah. So, uh, thank you again. Sandro, so what do, you, uh, what do you reckon? By the way, Sandro, you are in Italy right now, no? Yes, uh, good afternoon from Naples. Uh, ah, I'm very fantastic. sorry I could not be with you. Uh, but thank you so much, Giuliano, for having me on this panel. And it's a pleasure to be with you all this, uh, this afternoon. Um, I happen to know some people through their publications, through their papers, so it's also a first for me to be able to at least put a name to a face, uh, not just a photo, but a video. Um, I'd like to take the, the position of some of the museum directors and some of the staff in museums that I work with now as a, as a consultant and try to ask the questions that they would ask me if I had to pitch neuroscience as a possible tool. And when I say tool, uh, I also mean that it's probably one of the tools, I wouldn't say it's one of the latest tools, but it's certainly a tool that museums can include in their in their toolbox um, to solve problems, challenges, issues, and so on and so forth. So we have we have connoisseurship, for example, as far as the art museum is concerned, and there are studies. Um, I would single out Jean Demers' uh, well-known paper on neuroscience and and um, um, connoisseurship. That has been that, no, that has been cited. There's also artificial intelligence, which is rarely used from the curatorial side of things, but it's been used extensively. Well, extensively, it's I mean everything is is a bit relative, but it has been used, for example, for bookshops, uh, for for museum shops to understand the sales potential of products on display in 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 shops, and yet the curatorial side of things are still struggling with understanding the, the potential. No? So the first question I would ask is how does neuroscience fit in as a tool in our in our toolbox, in the in the museum toolbox that uh, that we are building for the, 20, for the 21st century museum? I mean, all the tools that we need are there um, and perhaps this could give us something that AI, uh, which could give us also um, eye movement on paintings, um, dwelling time and so on and so forth. How does this fit in with what neuroscience can bring to the to the table? The other point I wanted to raise uh, refers to what John Falk um, has 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 mentioned, rightly so. Emotions leading to to well-being. Um, I think that the biggest challenge museums have today is generalization. John Falk did mention that. Um, studies on emotions are relatively still limited and the study is still in its infancy. What's more is that sometimes we tend to forget context, the context based approach. The way we understand a museum in the Mediterranean, for example, is very different from how it's understood in the US and elsewhere. So the centrality of the material culture that is on display, the conservation, uh, huge emphasis on the conservation of, of, of objects which are oftentimes considered as relics akin to Catholic relics as well. And the fact that the container, the building is oftentimes uh, also a museum artifact. So um, can, can um, neuroscience help us bridge the gap when we look at the context-based uh, approach 
to understanding our visitors, their mental models as to how and what a museum is and what a, what a museum stands for and their expectations. That's my second point. My third point refers to museum organograms, because at the end of the day, this is one other possibility, one other resource, and yet museum organograms are sometimes cast in stone. There is curatorial work that oftentimes overlaps with museum educators and what they do. Um, I mean, it's also a challenge introducing um, um, and the digital. Uh, um, most museums tend to focus on on a department or on on a section that deals with digitization and so on and so forth. And yet, digital literacy and the digital uh, side of things, if we understand it as a language, should be something that you know that should be learned across the board. I'm using analogy here. So, what do museums need to do to tap into the full potential of of neuroscience? Um, I'd like to close with one with one reflection. Sometimes museums tend to uh, or work very hard to promote inclusion, but sometimes by doing that, they also promote exclusion. And I'm 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 looking at at, at special needs here when we create experiences that are experiences that are exclusively for special needs. I mean, how can we understand? How can we create and how can um, neuroscience help us create experiences that are inclusive across identities, across, um, I wouldn't use the word disabilities, but across ac across um, um, special needs, because at the end of the day, each one of us has a particular special need. Thank you very much. So, Sandra, I was sure that you would have um, brought us a, a very rich uh, and uh, intervention, and you <coughs> you managed to to meet my expectations. I would say that uh, between all the points that you were raising, there is one one thing which is probably yes uh, comes out from every one of them, which is uh, integration. Sort of how do we integrate, uh, uh, for example, different uh, visions of the museums in different cultures? How do we integrate experiences for different audiences? How do we integrate uh, um, neuroscience with AI and so on? So the idea really is uh, how, how can we put together and bridging the gap, as you were saying, bridging the gap. Uh, when you were talking about uh, the different, uh, um, uh, for example, expertises that are in museums like uh, curators, educators, and so on, I'm sure that this uh, rang a bell uh, to Dana, because in design thinking, one of the main tenets is that uh, you have got to uh, break the silos. You have got to put together an interdisciplinary team, uh, like uh, uh, a curator with an uh, person uh, from education, uh, with a person from the technical services, because this is the only way uh, to, to, to have new ideas, to, to break the boundaries of uh, what's always been done. So uh, again, when, you, when, you, when you're asking how neuroscience can help in this uh, breaking apart of, the, of these boundaries, which are basically in our mind, so uh, this, is, uh, this is absolutely spot on. And so coming, uh, coming here, Tiana, what do you, what do you think about it, uh, starting from your experiences? Uh, good afternoon to everyone. I am very happy to be here and thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. I was really delighted when I uh, heard about uh, Annalisa book and the title of the book, The Brain Friendly Museum, because it was so interesting title. And I was, as a museum director who is working in the museum practice for more than 20 years, always thinking about what we are doing. We are, doing, we are trying to be kids-friendly museum, baby-friendly museum, even pet-friendly museum. But I never thought about uh, brain-friendly museum. And actually, everything that we are doing is about brain, because from brains, comes learning and comes emotions. And for me, museums are all about learning or having new uh, ideas and uh, having emotions. So uh, when I, for the first time, read the title, I really felt that that is some totally new approach and that I should discuss about that with my team. 
and I have a great team of young people and curators and conservators, and we're really working as a team all together in all our jobs. And Sandro knows that very well because he used to work with us on some projects, and I hope that we will work in the future again. And that was totally new position. Should we think about ourselves as a brain-friendly museum? And what does it mean? Does it mean the color of the walls? Does it mean the atmosphere that we create? Does it mean the way how we present works of art? Or is it uh, messages that we want to send through the, our exhibitions? So uh, I totally agree with um, uh, John Falk and his idea that uh, his idea that most important part of museum work is emotion and well-being because emotions and well-being are making better society and we are all trying to make a better society because that will make better world for all of us so as a national art gallery we are trying to do different things and we don't have the partners so much in the science like you are all part of the science we are more practice practice we try practically to find solutions so after the period of um, corona we had one project it was a room for indulgence in art or room for enjoying in the art where we re because in that moment we realized that museum is the safest place for culture so we should invite people to come to museum again and to stay in one room enjoy uh, in one painting uh, by themselves and to create some safe space and to just uh, be alone with the painting and enjoy that painting and learn something from that painting of sculpture so we had so much visitors because they really find that something new. They realize that it is really a um, great experience, new experience for them. For us, it was free because we just put one painting from our depository in one room and one uh, comfortable chair. And then they, uh, we change painting every month. And then people was asking all the time, what will be the next, what will be the next? So we realized that they are coming to museum every month to see what painting do we choose for them and to have their own communication with that painting. So then we start asking them, what would you like to see in that room? What kind of painting of sculpture or something like that? And through that experience, we realized how people can really feel good in the museum. And for me, the question that I would like to know from neuroscience is, how to make people feel good in the museum. What is that what makes them comfortable? What is that what makes them uh, to want to come again? And I think that that is the point of the museum. For us, we always have our ideas, what we want to show, what exhibition, what works of art, what message to send. But the most important question is all that. How to make people feel good in the museum and how to understand better the messages that we want to send them through the thematic of our, our works of art or our exhibitions or our everyday job. So thank you very much for inviting me and to, to giving me the new perspective. How can we improve works in the museum or how can we better understand what is our job and how our museum job can better change the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. And uh, the, the, the great thing is that you are really putting uh, this, these words uh, in practice. And uh, I, can, uh, I can really tell. And also the fact that uh, when uh, coming to you, you really realize that you are a team. You are not, uh, you're just the coach of, uh, of the big and very, very integrated team, which is, uh, which is fantastic. And you made me think with your, um, sub this is only one of the great activities that you do there. I really encourage you to get in contact with her and uh, having her telling you well, what, what she's doing, what, what they are doing, sorry, <laughs> what they are doing at the museum, because really they are doing lots of fantastic initiatives. But this idea of having a, 
a, a, a, an even safer place inside the museum, which already is a safe place, of course, for the people uh, who had the privilege of being uh, uh, taught that the museum is a safe place. We, we shouldn't uh, forget this. But, uh, for example, when you are, uh, when you are in, a, in a culture totally different from yours, when you are, uh, for example, a tourist in an unknown city, you don't know where to go, you don't know exactly where is safe, and you know when you enter a museum, you're already in a safe place. And then the idea of, uh, of creating an even safer place, I think, uh, I find it's... Uh, it's fantastic. I mean, it's very, it's very compelling. And the last, but absolutely not least, <laughs> Lucia, uh, I'll give you this. And uh, so what's your point? <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's very difficult to, um, to speak after John Falk. <laughs> for, after for all of us, so don't worry. <laughs> for all of us. Yes. After uh, all, um, uh, Dana, uh, Licia, and, and the other guests, because uh, they told all about uh, the museum experience. And um, I think that um, uh, uh, we are uh, all Italians in, uh, in this. Uh, in uh, in this um, contest and uh, i say that uh, we can go out uh, uh, and, uh, and we can say uh, we can see that uh, italian museums uh, don't um, uh, don't have these practices and uh, the museum experience uh, the famous uh, and uh, uh, um, the famous sentence, which uh, is at uh, the base of all our studies, uh, is, is not uh, very connected with Italian museums. So we can go out and we, we don't find the same um, atmosphere, uh, the same uh, cultural atmosphere that we uh, have here. And uh, there is a gap in Italy. And um, uh, I think that um, this gap is, is, um, is not so, so deep, it's not so big. Because uh, in the past, uh, many and many um, experts in museum studies uh, in uh, late, uh, uh, for example, in late uh, 17, uh, they say something about museum experience, but with, an, uh, with other words, it was another, uh, another uh, word uh, um, very different from this. And I want to, uh, to, um, uh, start uh, from Georges Henri Rivière uh, because I uh, I read uh, um, the the papers uh, the museology uh, f mm, uh, the museology uh, la museologie selon Georges Henri Rivière and um, I found uh, this sentence. It was about uh, late 70. The success of a museum is not measured by the number of visitors it receives, but by the number of visitors to whom it has taught something. We say, just say this. is not measured by the number of exhibited objects but by the number of objects that can be perceived by visitors within the humor con context. When I, uh, when I read perceived, oh, he uh, is just uh, um, understood all that we uh, are uh, talk about now, are talking about now. 
is not measured by its size, but by the amount of space the, pub, the um, visitors had reasonably been able to traverse to derive genuine benefits from it. Benefits. We, are, we have three or four of the words um, we are talking about now. And uh, I think that um, in Italy, um, we have two, two different directions. The directions of a research, research in uh, neuroscience, uh, in museum visitor experience, and uh, um, but this uh, field uh, is quite difficult for everybody in museum studies in Italy to understand. So we can, I'm, uh, I repeat, in Italy, we can start from the past and uh, uh, um, we can uh, um, go on uh, because uh, this uh, road is um, is uh, is open. It just opened, and um, I'm I'm talking not with you, but with all the experts in museum studies uh, in Italy, because uh, um, we have uh, an um, uh, focus on aesthetic experience rather than. Uh, museum's experience uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the science of uh, uh, mm, neuroscience, uh, visual perception, and so on. And uh, um, I think that uh, uh, this is the, the point. We have to connect uh, uh, the environmental uh, um, well-being and the perception in um, in uh, in the uh, in the environment of museums with uh, this um, uh, aesthetic uh, trend uh, and uh, i uh, in my experience this is very difficult and the dialogue between um, me uh, the university my teaching uh, and uh, uh, what the, my students uh, um, found uh, in, uh, in museums, uh, um, it's very difficult to, uh, to have a good dialogue because uh, um, these are uh, the different uh, points of view. And um, I think uh, we have only to go back in the past and all that John Falk said in uh, quite 40 years is just in uh, European um, studies. And so there is, uh, there is not um, a conflict. It's all a uh, fluxus, uh, a great fluxus. Sorry for uh, my English, but my um, uh, I I wanted to talk about uh, other uh, topics, no, but, but uh, uh, all of you uh, said all, <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I think I think that. Um, uh, my uh, uh, I, I have to go in in the past because no, I, I'm historic. Uh, yeah, don't Thank worry you. because you you made I think a very very important point. So the fact that in fact there is a resistance. Well, now you're mentioning Italy and because we all know the situation. But I have to say that I think the experience of all of us.
is that even in other uh, countries, maybe in a less evident way, but still there are, so even in, I don't know, in Serbia, there is the Matice Gallery, but there are also other museums, we won't make names, don't worry, <laughs> but there are other museums which are like the museums we know. And uh, in the same way as in Italy, there are some very advanced museums, but most of museums uh, are unfortunately uh, backwards in this, but also in the US there are some museums which are not. So this idea of the visitor center museums, just to use the words of uh, uh, Manderson and Peter Semis, the visitor center museums is still uh, coming, but uh, the, we can see the uh, some front runners, but uh, we are still far from a real visitor center museums here, but also in other countries, in the UK, in the US, so don't, uh, don't worry for, um, for that. But I think that it was very important, your remark, that uh, um, we can help bridge this uh, distance between what, what is conceived as uh, a, a trend of the moment, no? Because the, the problem with technology and, uh, is that uh, it can be, okay, considered very well for the wow effect, but also considered, you know, ah, this is something just the fashion and we'll, uh, we'll go out of fashion. But in, you're totally right. If we can connect it to the sacred texts on which the Oktar Museum generation studied, then we really can bridge the gap to, uh, to go back to what... Uh, Sandra was saying. So thank you, thank you very much. It was a very important remark, I think. And so Andrea, now <laughs> uh, all this question snowballed on you, mm -hmm. and now it's up to you. What uh, what are you telling us? Uh, some some your your thoughts about it. So uh, thank you first of all for having me today, and uh, thank you for the interventions uh, and the contributions of the distinguished speakers that. Uh, um, well, before me, uh, well, <clears throat> it seems that uh, the question is whether it is possible to use uh, neuroscience to define the best possible museum experience. Uh, well, uh, maybe it's not the type of answer that you expect from me, uh, but I think the, the answer is not straightforward. I think that the answer is very complex. Uh, maybe I could be biased because, uh, you know, I'm part of the field, but uh, I really think that the problem lies in the significant level of hope and uh, expectation and anticipation that surrounds actually the field of neuroscience. So today, really many people hold the expectation that neuroscience can provide, uh, you know, breakthroughs and transformative solutions to a wide range of, of complex problems uh, from economics, uh, you know, to ethics, uh, uh, to social challenges, uh, you know, to uh, mental health diseases, uh, uh, and including, uh, we, we are listening today, the enhancement uh, of the museum experience. So I think that uh, uh, these expectations uh, should be a bit tempered because while neuroscience has made remarkable progress uh, and uh, no doubt that it contributed valuable insights into uh, the understanding, the working of the human brain. Um, I think that uh, it is crucial also to understand what neuroscience is and uh, which methods it employs to understand also the limitation of these fields. So basically neuroscience uh, is nothing else that uh, a field that seeks to uncover the functioning of the nervous system. So the brain and its function. And uh, to this end, it employs a wide array of techniques, uh, including, for example, uh, neurophysiological techniques, uh, some were mentioned during the talks, uh, um, you know, uh, fMRI, uh, EEG, uh, neurochemistry, uh, behavioral experiments, uh, and the goal, as I said, is to investigate the correlation between uh, brain functioning uh, and the various cognitive processes and behaviors. So, while these methods uh, have provided uh, many insights into areas such as perception, emotion, and decision making, uh, when it comes to define the best museum experience, uh, we encounter several challenges. First of all, subjectivity. 
human experiences are subjective uh, and context dependent. Uh, I think this was this point was raised by Sandro de Bono. Okay, so generalization is complex because we are different individuals. We have we have different human beings. Uh, so what constitutes the best museum experience for one person may not hold true for another. So of course, the neuroscience can provide objective data on brain responses to attempt to, you know, standardize what are the typical response to a piece of art or, uh, or an artifact, but uh, it may not capture the full richness of the individual experience, which, by the way, I think is the very focus uh, and the very target uh, of a museum design, right? To leverage uh, on the individual experiences uh, and individual differences and, and not to standardize them, right? Because a museum is not a McDonald's, so you don't expect the same experience for everyone. And, uh, and, 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 and aesthetic experiences are complex. Emotions are complex things. So uh, neuroscience can elucidate the neural correlates of emotions. Uh, it may not provide an understanding of the complex interplay of, for example, uh, uh, emotional responses and aesthetic preferences, because when it comes to meaning, and meaning is a very part of emotions, meaning uh, cannot be, you know, reduced and boiled down to the function of the brain. Not to speak about ethical considerations of using neuroscience, uh, you know, um, uh, as a method to extract data from users, it raises concerns about privacy uh, and the potential manipulations of visitors' emotions and perception as well. So in order to optimize something, you need to collect data and to provide feedback according to this data, but uh, we need to be very careful how this feedback is provided, uh, considering that uh, this data could be used also for other means and not only just for optimizing, uh, you know, the museum experience. So, um, I think that uh, uh, before using neuroscience to inform the design, I think it becomes crucial to define what constitutes an optimal museum experience, what constitutes positive emotions, and how they can be invited, uh, how it can be elicited. Considering that, again, positive emotions can vary greatly from person to person and culture to culture, and uh, uh, in this sense, I believe that uh, understanding which positive emotions, which positive experiences are relevant to the audience and how they can be evoked or invited requires a multidisciplinary approach that uh, can be integrated by neuroscience, but, but not limited to neuroscience. It should integrate the study of emotions, which is the goal of psychology, not neuroscience, and their neural underpinnings, which is the very goal of neuroscience. Okay? So, um, for example, an emerging field uh, of uh, positive psychology, uh, which goal uh, uh, is actually to uh, understand what are the factors uh, uh, human strengths and virtues uh, that help people flourishing. This is an evidence-based field that is growing, uh, and it was founded by um, Seligman, Martin Seligman, and Mikey Csikszentmihalyi. I think, for example, this is a psychological field, but can contribute a lot of knowledge, a lot of insights uh, to, first of all, understanding uh, what type of uh, you know experience we are targeting, and when we understand this, we have understood this, then we can also try to integrate some objective measures in order to understand if what we are designing for is actually matched by the actual uh, experience. Yes, well, thank you for your, uh, for your answer, which was, uh, uh, well, basically, basically you are saying that, uh, yes, uh, it's only one of the tools in the belt and we have to understand specifically what what it can done uh, what can be done with uh, with neuroscience and uh, also again you're getting back to what many of us are saying so that uh, it's uh, the most important thing is uh, uh, having i think a clear goal in mind which is uh, a the good vi a good visitor experience first and secondly that you have got to integrate 
integrate tools, uh, integrate goals, uh, integrate uh, people. For example, uh, it's, it's essential that uh, a, even a neuroscientist or a psychologist coming into a museum works with the curators in order to understand how the museum works. In fact. Absolutely. Because otherwise, if you come just from, uh, from the outside uh, without knowing uh, all the subtleties of the museum machine, then you're missing the point. Uh, in a way, it's very easy to, uh, to make mistakes. And also to have yourself not, uh, not valued by the museum insiders because they say they, they just discount you. And, uh, and, it's, big, uh, and uh, it's a big pity. So I, uh, I perfectly understand. And, uh, um, but uh, just to go back uh, uh, to, some, uh, to some of the questions, is there any one of them that you could find more suitable to be uh, approached with a neuroscientific or integrated neuroscientific approach? Or you think they are, uh, they are all, uh, in brackets, too complex to be... Uh, 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 to be uh, faced with uh, neuroscience. What's your take on that? Well, I, I, not at all. I think that uh, all uh, challenges that have been uh, described uh, in the previous interventions, they can all be tackled by uh, you know, uh, neuroscience uh, and allied disciplines. Uh, but uh, uh, what I, I, I tried to do was a bit of demystifying uh, yes. uh, the, the centrality of the neuroscience uh, for answering uh, all the questions, because I think we are over-delegating uh, you know, neuroscience uh, to answer questions. And I think this is uh, also a kind of epistemological bias, because uh, you know, when you see numbers, when you see data, when you see measure, <laughs> when you see instruments, uh, you, know, you, you tend to trust more that this is a scientific field. And uh, you know, there is, a, in my opinion, a huge bias today over scientism of uh, 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 experience or scientification of experience, I don't know how to define it. Uh, because uh, it looks like uh, if we don't have data, then we are not able to design, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> not experience, but it's not true at all. So I understand that uh, we cannot only rely on uh, the intuition and creativity of our, our designers and museum creators uh, to design optimal experience, but uh, um, uh, I think it's important that Again, I have a conflict of interest. Again, I, I'm from the field, so I, I, I should do, I should say the opposite. But uh, I truly uh, believe that uh, integration is the key. And neuroscience are okay if you need to corroborate with objective data. What are some subjective, you know, um, uh, reports or intuition? But I don't think that we should delegate neuroscience the key to improve the deserved experience uh, because uh, uh, this centrality put at risk uh, the whole reputation of the field in my opinion. I 100% agree and I pass the ball to Dana because what you are saying is one of, of the main concepts of design thinking which is that you can have great intuitions even by talking with just one visitor and getting an insight just uh, from the uh, human empathy you've got with even one visitor. Just by talking, you can have the, a great idea, and then you can go on and verifying it. But it's a very human thing that comes out of a relationship. So I'm, uh, I'm sure that Dana will, uh, will agree, don't you? Yeah, may, may I just add this provocatory comment? Uh, just to boil down into a single sentence, uh, I don't think that in order to understand if I'm falling in love with someone, uh, I need uh, an fMRI. <laughs> the but data maybe, point I, of your... <laughs> fMRI can, can help me, you know, uh, uh, understanding if I more in love with someone else, but uh, you know, feelings uh, are something that uh, are very part of the human nature, and uh, in, you can describe your feelings to someone else. You know, so uh, I, I, of course, uh, this is just uh, a provocation. Uh, I understand yes, yes, that yes. neuroscience can provide a lot of more data. Fantastic, and uh, Dana and the others, of course. Do you want to to add? We still have a few minutes. I'd like you to add uh, to add something to this uh, to this discussion, and especially to comment on what uh, Andrea just said. Shall I okay. speak? Yes, yes, yes. Go, Dana. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just really appreciated uh, really appreciated that that 
I, I see in, in my work with, with many museums this, this obsession with, with data and this reliance on everything, everything in the museum we can get data. And, and yes, there are things that we can capture data about, but there are some things that I love that thing about, you know, do I need an fMRI to say I'm falling in love with somebody? I mean, there are some things that are human and we can do very simple things like having a conversation with visitors, observing visitors, and and looking for patterns among small groups of visitors, but we don't need to quantify and have data to justify and prove everything. And I see, see a lot of museum professionals um, doing things that I think are actually harmful and, and, and almost dangerous, like thinking everything can be surveyed. We can survey everything, and they think that that's data, and then you look at the kind of questions we're asking visitors and say, this is this is absurd. What what are we trying to do? I mean, I, I have to share an example. I won't name the museum, but I saw a museum run a survey. I mean, I could not believe this, where they asked people, when you look at a work of art, how many minutes do you spend in front of the object? And the options were like, 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes. I was like, I have no idea. I don't know how long I spend in front of a work of art. You're gonna trust me to answer that question? Oh, look, we ran a survey and everybody said they spent three minutes. Like that kind of thing drives me crazy. And I think it's dangerous to the field. And I think this is where people are over relying on thinking we can capture data. And there has to be a, a balance between, yes, what can we, where can we get data? Where can we turn to neuroscience? Where can we use other fields to gather data? And where can we just be human beings and go have a conversation with visitors and understand their emotions and go sit down and do something as simple as talking to 10 people and, and then unpacking what did we learn from those conversations? So I'll, I'll stop there and I'll pass it to, to Sandro. Fantastic. Sandra? Thanks, Dana. Um, the word that came to mind when I was following what, what you were presenting is intuition. Because sometimes, and as an, as an ex-museum director myself, um, I mean, you, you wouldn't have the data more often than not to decide on something that is crucial, that is fundamental for just about anything. It could be programming, it could be outreach, and so on and so forth. And there are very basic tools. I mean, like, you know, opting to do a tour of your for your visitors every week to just get the sense of who is turning up um, at your museum. So, I mean, it's the reason why I mentioned toolbox, because we have so many tools that probably we need to understand the real purpose of this new tool uh, in our toolbox before we can really understand the full impact and the full potential that uh, it, 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 it holds. I'd like to add just one comment and I'd like to build on what on what Professor Cataldo has, has, has mentioned, and I fully agree, I fully concur that John Falk's uh, arguments and research are very valid even for our region, for this region. My point is that, I mean, what are the stumbling blocks then that are holding back? What are the mental models so much ingrained, so much structures in our history that are holding us from developing visitor participatory experiences, because we didn't mention that, and also possibly fostering a culture of inhabiting the museum and making the museum as hope. And this takes us to Oran Pamuk and his um, modest manifesto for, for um, um, small, uh, small museums. The paradox of all this is that this region created the Agora. This region is the birthplace of the forum which was a meeting place, which was a place for conversations. And perhaps, perhaps neuroscience can help us understand why we lost this possibility and how we can use this possibility to really foster a contact point, a contact zone, which is a museum. Lucia, you want to answer? Uh, I, I totally agree with you. And uh, I, I just, uh, I'm just trying to understand why. <laughs> uh, we all are, we all are. I work with Italian museums and I ask the same questions every day. Um, I think that we, uh, we want uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to do uh, this uh, uh, to to um, uh, to have this uh, gap uh, to um, I think uh, 
we can uh, uh, remind that a uh, museum is uh, an agora, but we, we don't want uh, to... Um, it's totally uh, different from uh, the, the museum uh, that we now, that we have. But uh, uh, in the past, also during the um, French uh, Revolution, uh, the, the museum um, became uh, an agora, became an agora. Uh, uh, in, but uh, then uh, I think it's uh, like um, uh, an oscillation, a uh, going back and forth. Back and forth, but uh, I think it, uh, you are right. Uh, we have to remind every day. It, I think this uh, would be the the general mission of all museums. Museum is an agora. <laughs> Dot. <laughs> and uh, I, I will exactly. I, I was willing to, to call on you because, uh, well, she's got a museum which is an Agora. So, and uh, for example, uh, today you were telling me, uh, I just I, I ask you two small questions uh, to, to explain us. The first one is why curators w w are forced in your museum to do guided tours? And uh, the second one is to explain uh, how do you bring citizens as curators inside the, the museums? So, okay. Thank you very much for these questions. Uh, I think about our museum as a platform for, for dialogue. But if you want to have a dialogue, you need to listen other side. It is not platform for telling what you are thinking. It is platform to, to have a conversation. So all my curators, and also all conservators, they are guides because they need to know the visitors. They need to see their eyes when they are talking to them, when they are boring and when they are exciting. So then you know what we are doing and what is the reason why the museum exists in the contemporary world. Who are our visitors? To who are we talking or for who are we making our programs? And on the other side, we, we decide to to meet our visitors through the project People of Novi Sad Choose. Sandro know that project very well. We choose 40 different peoples, professors, uh, hairdressers, uh, uh, owners of the restaurants, totally different 40 peoples of Novi Sad, and we invite them to our institution to go to backstage, to get in our shoes and to choose one painting who is telling the story about them. So we made an uh, exhibition of 40 paintings of people of Novi Sad and we put it as a part of our permanent exhibition because we want to show to everyone that museum belongs to everyone. It does not belong only to us who are working in the museum. We are not the, the only one who can say this painting is important and this painting is beautiful. No, you can choose. Visitors can choose also and they could be a part of us. And as a, in that project, everyone was involved, not only curators, but me as a director and a, a person who is in charge for law and person who is in charge for money. And my uh, secretary, everyone was part of that project because we all need to know, know who is our visitors, what they expect from the visit of the museum and how they are dealing with our job. And that was an amazing project and people were so satisfied and we had so many visitors during the opening of the exhibition and later they gave a tour. They gave a tour why they choose this painting and they invite their friends and said, oh, I choose this painting for this and this reason. So I think that this kind of program shows that museums is participatory. So you need to be open to your public. You need to have a conversation with them and to show them that their, the museums belongs to them also. When muse, museum belongs to them, they will feel proud and they will continuously come and they will feel good in your museum. 
So that is um, our practice, but it is uh, due to that that we are a small museum with not so many tourists. And maybe that is the reason why we need to fight to be a part of our uh, city and our citizens. And uh, we really feel like that. And they understand that. And that's why they are coming very often. And they feel good in the museum. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Um, so just two very brief uh, questions, uh, one to Richa and the final one to Andrea. Um, to Richa, I'd like to, to go back to neurosciences. You mentioned uh, very quickly that you, you had a neuroscience uh, 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 evaluation of your museums, but it, it was rather inconclusive or well, you, you gather some data, but uh, non, not all the ones that you, that you would have liked. Um, what would you... In your opinion, what you could have done better in working, uh, because you've been very honest and open, and I like the fact that, uh, that, that you told us that, because usually uh, you hear successes, but it's also very important uh, to hear, uh, I wouldn't say failures, but I would say things that could be done better. So in your opinion, now, now uh, what could you have done better in order to get uh, more, uh, more data, more valuable data uh, in, your, in your case? I think uh, the problem that we uh, experienced during that evaluation was what, what Andrea was mentioning before and also Sandor, the idea that, you know, we cannot generalize. And that was really what came out of that evaluation. Uh, so I cannot really speak about that kind of approach because it's really not mine. But what I think is that as a whole, where we could have where we could improve and what we should do better next time is really to integrate this more, you know, yeah, that was with skin conductance, so biometric measurements with something more subjective. And for me, this subjectivity can also be captured going beyond just interviewing and observing, but really also opening up to other uh, arts based methods, you know, to poetry, to performance, really to make sure that you really get to the emotions, to the live experience of the of your visitors and understand uh, what kind of emotions and what triggers these emotions and when and also when they feel them, because the point of this study was really to understand when the visit of the museum would trigger experience uh, emotions. And because it was the experience was designed during storytelling, we really had this storytelling model in mind and we knew ah, here is the climax here. Certainly something would uh, hap would happen. And indeed it was like that. So also the emotions, the arousal was triggered in that way uh, using this this model. But OK, that was not really yeah impressive as a result as such. And I think the problem was really, I don't know if you want to call it triangulation or integration. It was solely, fo sol solely focused on the on the biometric measurement. Yeah, OK, very interesting. Thanks. And uh, Andrea, to, to end with you on a, again on something similar to uh, uh, to what Licia um, just uh, so just said. Um, so which is in your opinion you've been you've done a great job of uh, uh, telling us not to over over rely on neurosciences but which is in your opinion the ideal use case of neurosciences in a museum so when when and how a museum could in your opinion could, could be really helped by uh, uh, calling a neuroscientist or, uh, or, uh, or a psycho-neuroscientist? <laughs> What's your opinion? Well, I think that, uh, honestly speaking, uh, I think that uh, there is uh, more uh, to neuroscience uh, to gain uh, from uh, studying uh, museum experience uh, than from uh, a museum to gain from neuroscience. Because I think that uh, you know a museum uh, is a, um, a complex experience, but uh, at the same time a controlled one. It's a natural laboratory that allows to collect ecological data on one of the highest and most complex uh, processes that goes on in the mind-brain system, uh, which are aesthetic experiences, you know engagement with art artifacts and so on and uh, this is very difficult to do in uh, a university lab uh, 
uh, what you, you can do using, for example, virtual reality, and we did in our lab, um, we, you can do using uh, PowerPoint uh, or videos and so on, but nothing is comparable to a real museum experience. So I think that we should start for considering, from considering museum as an open, and it's a living lab to say, to improve uh, the methods and integrate the methods for understanding uh, such complex experiences. And starting from this, then to gain new insights and to uh, develop new uh, ideas uh, and knowledge that could eventually be used uh, to improve the museum experience. But I don't think that we are now in a maturity of the field that really allows to drive design guidelines. Well, thank you. I'm not so pessimistic. I mean, some some knowledge can be gathered, some knowledge can be really useful, but I don't think that uh, the neuron goes to the museum uh, is exactly the uh, situation that we are now, uh, you know, uh, living. I think that uh, we have still the person that goes to the museum and some neurons uh, uh, are highlights uh, during this experience, uh, but I don't think that uh, we can replace the person with the neuron uh, with the current state uh, of the neuroscience advancement. But again, I'm very optimistic about the idea of using a museum as a, an open and leading lab uh, for getting data that have, have more ecological validity on uh, mm -hmm. uh, such ones than complex aesthetic experiences. I think this is a fantastic conclusion because you know what? The fact is that museum is at the service of society. So the idea that museum can help university, can help researchers Absolutely. in getting more data, more valuable data for their research, I think this is one of the many possibilities that museums help to uh, can has uh, uh, museums have to, to be able to help society so uh, yeah. i don't consider it a negative conclusion i consider it a super positive conclusion and uh, thank you because you you again uh, how can i say stress the value that museums can have in society i think this is the most important message that you can uh, that we can give uh, today so, thank you to all of you. Thank you very much. It's been, I think, a super interesting uh, session. So, a big uh, round of applause for, for you. And um, thank you very much. And uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, thank again uh, Annalisa and let's keep in touch for, uh, uh, for further uh, interesting integrated museum integrated museums project thank you and let's pass on to the next uh, session thank you very much